And I will introduce the presenters, Tobias Ten Brink. Uh, he is from the University of Witten Herdecke, and he's a fellow at the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt. Uh, then there is Givok Shin, professor of sociology at Stanford University. He's also the director of the Walter Schoenstein Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford University. And then there's Andrew Rosser, director of the Indo-Pacific Governance Research Center at Adelaide. Um, Professor Ten Brink. Okay, uh, so uh, thanks very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak here. So I will largely have a look at the past in order to understand some of the dynamics in contemporary China. I won't speculate too much about the future, but some of what I will present probably has some implications for that as well. Um, so, um, the, what I'm doing here, I wanna, the introduction is already underway, right? I give you some vantage point, theoretical vantage point on, on how to understand the institutional foundations for long-term growth in China in order to understand um, whether these might also produce today, or in the current phase, increasing problems. Um, so factors for long-term growth, especially external or favorable external opportunity structures, but more importantly here, and an emphasis here on the kind of institutional fit between different institutional spheres within Chinese capitalism. Um, in order then to, to answer or give partial answers to the question of whether China's boom is about to come to an end. This is at least the discussions we had over the summer, very much um, in, in Western public discourse at, 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 at last. So yes, the main assumption for this um, talk here is that we need to know more about the long-term, sorry, about the institutional foundation for long-term growth in order to answer this question, whether the boom is about to come to an end. Okay, good. So, the kind of theoretical vantage, vantage points that I, I want to talk about. So, theoretically, this article combines insights from comparative as well as international political economy. Um, it follows largely historical institutional analysis um, by comparing the Chinese economy to other forms of capitalism, historically and contemporary, so to more liberal oriented or more coordinated oriented capitalisms, but more importantly to East Asian developmental states, and last not least, to other large emerging economies, such as India and Brazil, where we find surprisingly uh, uh, similarities uh, with China. So when I speak of we here, I have to say that this is partly also work which I conducted together with colleagues at Frankfurt University, Andreas Nölke, Christian May, and Simone Klar. So the kind of historical institutional analysis and comparative perspective led us to develop in recent years the concept of a novel variegated form of state permeated capitalism in China. Uh, its activity being based on close, mainly, not all, but mainly based on close competition-driven operations between various state and domestic business alliances at the national, but more importantly, at the local level, and not solely by an all-powerful centralized uh, steering bureaucracy. And this is in contrast to analysis who do not distinguish the contemporary Chinese economy from older varieties of state-led economies. So thus, the kind of weaker term of state permeation rather than classic terms such as state dirigisme or state steering. Um, well, this is a strategy of mixed methods. We mixed here qualitative and quantitative um, uh, data in order to enhance validity. Okay, so this brings me to some factors for long-term growth. Uh, certainly, external factors are very important here. To begin with, um, there is a strategy of selective global integration on the Chinese side. Uh, so that is 
preferences for autonomous national development, which, and I have to say, over time, including policy reversals, a lot of contingencies, uh, which led to a differentiated matrix of deep integration, rather deep integration into international trade and global production networks, on the one hand, and comparably shallow integration into global capital markets on the other. Um, and this strategies, if, if we can speak of a strategy, um, was supported by good timing and geographical factors. So think of a revolution in technological and organizational development which aided China's global integration, i.e. it allowed the restructuring of Western companies into global production networks and to delegate parts of complex production processes to Chinese contract manufacturers, for instance. So the boom would, have ne would not have been possible 50 years ago, probably. Um, next, as an investment location, China was in the immediate vicinity of the East Asian growth region. Think about the 1970s and 1980s in East Asia. And more importantly, maybe, the networks of the overseas Chinese. So this, I think, we have already heard. Um, then there's a next uh, point, which I tentatively would, would, would um, title capital over accumulation in the global north, so to speak, meaning that normally authors single out low labor costs as pull factors for FDI to explain economic development in China, yet this tends to overlook, to overlook fundamental push factors for often risky investments. And these push factors, they have to do, I am speaking here of the 1990s and onwards, uh, until and into the 2000s, um, these push factors uh, have to do with a special global constellation, meaning that Western transnational capital was looking for more profitable investment opportunities, which it didn't found at home, which it didn't find at home, resulting from a kind of over-accumulation of capital, at times classified as a capital investment crisis in the tra traditional production centers, which then facilitated the relocation of capital investment uh, to China. The Chinese economy was thereby also able to grow at the expense of other emerging uh, countries. Think of Mexico, um, uh, for instance. Yet be more, before I move on to explain this, let me add here one point which I think is of importance. The fact that China became the most important attractive or the most, yeah, most attractive production location in the world at precisely the moment when real accumulation in the old centers was slowing down is an indication of something that has been underestimated in the kind of two top stories that are being told when looking at Chinese development. One, the liberal marketization success story, open up the markets and then it's good. And on the other side, uh, the Chinese state as a clever, forward-looking Leviathan superstar with a master plan shaping the economy at will. Yeah? So namely, the role of unintended, and in this respect here, beneficial external factors, um, so developments in the global economic system that uh, nobody really can control, right? So, but import, more important here for, this, for the story I, I, I want to tell today is the kind of institutional compatibilities of Chinese capitalism that I think are very important when understanding long-term growth in China. So mainly I am talking here about the mid 1990s to the early 2010s. And I will then in the next step talk about how and why these institutional fit um, might or have already been become problematic. Okay, good. So the idea here is that firms require expectational stability uh, if they would face contradictory signals of their uh, or by their economic ecosystem, this would be problematic as you all know. Therefore, institutions are crucial, and more important, I would argue, um, the need for a kind of compatibility between institutions is, is of great importance. What do I mean by that? So when looking at the corporate governance and investment finance spheres of the economy, 
This kind of fit, I would argue, can be grasped in that Chinese firms could calculate on both an enduring national control of enterprises, mostly through insiders, uh, and not only with respect to SOEs, by the way, you can today, you can also have private national champions, private city champions or regional champions, so to speak, um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, preferential networks, national networks of finance for investment, uh, dominated for a long time by a developmentalist banking system, I would argue, making mid to long term firm strategies practicable. So this meant, on the one hand, that firm strategies succeeded by forming close, I would argue, cronyist um, relationships um, with state managers, which also permitted to both breaking formal, rooms, uh, formal rules if necessary and to gain exclusive access to resources. And this proactive state support also fostered this kind of careful selective integration of foreign firms into China, thereby enabling some technology transfer, should overestimate the, the, the rate, but some technology transfer, and more importantly, preventing sellout, which so many more dependent market economies in the global south experienced over the last decades. On the other hand, firms raised investments mainly by way of internal savings and bank loans, um, which promoted a stronger role for patient capital and this also accommodated with long-term domestic firm strategies, I would argue. And it resulted in the famous abundance, let's say, supply, abundant supply of finance in China for a long, long time. This meant most large companies in China were relatively independent from short-term volatilities on global capital markets, and uh, as well as from profit expectations by transnational investors. So respect, with respect to the spheres of industrial relations, education and training and innovation, there's also a kind of fit, institutional fit, which I would argue. Um, so advantages for Chinese business actors since the mid-1990s were based on a kind of compatibility between lo large low-wage sectors with low and medium skill requirements largely, which in education system could provide, as with, in, in which, as you know, the majority of the working popula po population receives, and, yeah, receives a secondary education and some receive more special training by now and developed over the course of the 90s and 2000s. Um, so that overall, the kind of still comparably cheap, relatively disciplined um, labor force was complemented was complemented by skills adequately, I would argue, for a long time, um, and increasingly then by an output of higher skilled engineers, for instance, or technicians, uh, assisted by rising, by the way, rising public um, expenditure on education. So in conjunction with some progress in innovation capacity building, I would argue, this helped Chinese producers to effectively focus on largely medium tech production of medium range goods in which skill and innovation requirements are not overly sophisticated um, and at the same time the kind of medium range supply mostly matched demand of the new consuming classes in China as well as the demand of intermediate goods, think of machinery for instance, that incentivized domestic firms to specialize on these domestic markets. Okay. Um, so this brings me to my next slide. So additional, uh, one, uh, let's say, in the additional institutional fit and then one key comparative advantage. Regarding economic coordination, we find here a, an argument for further stability. And this is that there existed an overarching role for reciprocal and in, mostly informal local growth alliances be, between state and business actors. So very different from other models of capitalism, so ideal typically where the, mar, where, 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 where the market and contracts are, 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 are more important or where, where networks and business associations are more important, so think of Germany for instance, or where multinational companies and their hierarchies are more important in order to coordinate. Yeah? So these 
these local private-public growth alliances, I would argue, um, since they competed with each other, have moreover, for a long time at least, become a kind of corrective against harmful corruption, i.e. rent-seeking, that is the danger of this kind of close relationships, uh, and rather led to a kind of, I would argue, I, I argued this before, productive cronyism. So only think about economic efficiency here, right? So this has nothing to do with dem democracy and everything. But I would argue a kind of productive cronyism to real economic investment, um, although this also increased inequality, by the way. Yeah? Okay, so finally, this was assisted um, on the central level by a strong party state, which provided further stability despite vast regional heterogeneity and incessant institutional change. Yeah? And this is also very much in contrast to other large emerging economies where, where you don't find this strong a state. Yeah? So this is really um, the kind of uh, exception here. Um, okay, this brings me to, oh, I'm sorry. This brings me to a key comparative advantage. What is going on here? This brings me to a kind of key comparative advantage, sorry, um, which is that while for some time the Chinese economy could enjoy uh, comparative advantages uh, regarding the processing of labor-intensive goods, this changed, at least in the 2000s, or especially in the 2000s, um, where an increasing productiveness in capital-intensive production also made China a major player in advanced products, although, and this is, I think has to be underlined, although mostly in medium range and medium tech markets. They are able to tap into some high tech markets by now, think of Xiaomi, or medium, let's say medium range segments of high tech markets, but mostly they were concentrating and most competitive in medium range markets, in medium tech markets. Um, so export is important, right? Chinese producers are able to serve world and regional markets. South, South trade is an issue, as we just heard before. Uh, however, the domestic market, I think, is of prime importance, of greater importance. Um, oh. And here, um, for some time, Chinese firms um, had a lot of comparative advantages vis-a-vis um, -vis foreign firms due to their um, familiarity with national consumption patterns, close uh, relations to the state and so on and so forth. Okay, so this uh, then brings me, I have some minutes, fine, to the question whether these institutional compatibilities uh, uh, are running out of steam in a way, right? Um, so, and this is, so some points which I'd like to address. The idea clearly is that we might have the ability by this institutional analysis here to distinguish let's say somewhat more clearly which crisis factors actually are of prime, primary significance and which are not. Because as I said at the beginning, there are so many people addressing now the coming end of Chinese boom uh, today, but sometimes they are not really uh, uh, knowledgeable about how Chinese capitalism is, 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 is structured. So the notion, for instance, I begin with pub Western public discourse, that the end of one of the greatest uh, credit booms of all time in the 2000s, then prolonged by the quantitative easing, flooding emerging economies with cheap credit, cheap financing, that this will hit China hard, I think can be qualified on the basis of this analysis, since China is less dependent uh, from external finance when compared to other emerging countries, for instance. It is also less vulnerable from financial outflows uh, and in addition, portfolio capital is less important when compared to real investment, foreign direct investment, and largely controlled. On the level of trade, even though the threat of export stagnation due to demand stagnation in the global north is arguably a bigger problem, my analysis suggests that export stagnation may be compensated somewhat by still by domestic market growth, although some export-oriented sectors, and they exist some, fine, um, may face serious problems, no doubt about that. But I think some internal 
problems stemming from China's unique institutional architecture loom a little larger. And this can be grasped, um, this can be grasped sorry, in the financial system, for instance, in which new actors over the last years, I would argue, increasingly tend to undermine the kind of state permeated or developmentalist setting, if you will, um, so especially um, the introduction of new financial actors through partial liberalization, um, an increase in speculation and a bigger role for capital markets means that preserving the structural features of the old system may become increasingly difficult. Uh, it may also damage the largely unquestioned belief so far in the CCP's capacity to command key actors in the financial system. Yeah? So in a way then, the kind of proposals we hear in the West that China should liberalize more probably will create bigger problems in this kind of economy. Yeah? Um, with regard to economic coordination and corruption uh, or productive cronyism, I think there is increasing evidence lately, and, and uh, Lin Nan was talking about this uh, to, uh, um, 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 this morning, that tensions and conflicts between political and capital factions erupt with increasing frequency, which is then kind of illustrated by the recent recentralization efforts by the Xi government since 2013 in particular to address these conflicts. In my view, it remains to be seen whether these anti-corruption measures only limit, in a way, forms of harmful corruption, or whether they will also negatively affect, so to speak, productive cronyism, the local state business alliances, um, uh, as they might restrict yeah, intra-elite decision-making in this authoritarian form of capitalism. This is a sad story, but I think it's rather true. <laughs> uh, and pretty delicate also with respect to how corruption is normally understood. And um, okay, so the, the, the next point, I'll be briefly, yeah, I'll be brief here. Um, when looking at the state permeated um, and largely complementary corporate governance and corporate finance systems with an abundant supply of finance, this, and this is a problem, as there was so much money available, this actually led to problems of overinvestment in the large years and of increasing problems of mostly, we have to say, local debt, which means that even the central government is only partially coping with heavy competition between local growth alliances and their associated high-risk growth and financial policies. And then, uh, yeah increasing problems of bad loans, overinvestment, local indebtedness, and so on and so forth. Regarding industrial relations, this is my last point, regarding industrial relations, education, and training, innovation, there is a debate on the coming or already ongoing middle income trap in which China might be. Um, I'm a little more optimistic here. Still, doubts exist about whether the rising demand for higher skilled labor since some years now can indeed be covered by serious reforms, especially in vocational training. Um, it also holds true for the question whether China can move from imitation and some forms of innovation to, to real innovation. Um, so while upgrading in skills and innovation capacities might also contain detrimental effects on institutions such as a low wage regime, they may be also insufficient, so to speak, with respect to the challenge that of foreign firms that uh, produce where they sell, right? This is uh, Gary's argument. Um, and last but not least, this is actually the, the last sentence here, um, I, would, I would argue that trapped between, on the one hand, promises of social justice, this is very much what the Chinese government is also addressing, but at, this, at the other, on the other hand, the enduring belief in a segmented labor regime and the Hukou regime, which is only very s slowly uh, reformed, as a competitive advantage. Governmental crisis management, economic management, oscillates between social appeasement and business-oriented restructuring. And this, I think, leads to 
more and more um, uh, yeah, ideas of, of these that, 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 that proposed improvements are, are being too sluggish. And it, I think, nurtures the likelihood of social conflicts, of an increase in social conflicts, and also a decrease in the individual advancement motivations that so many Chinese had over the last decades. And I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you.